Well, I'm always amazed at how the Holy Spirit just lines up messages about what he's speaking and what he's doing. Last week, the messages that we heard from Apostle Bird on Holy Spirit and drawing closer to Holy Spirit and, and taking more time in our daily lives to pray in the Spirit, to invest in that prayer language and to communicate with him. You know, I used to say it's like when cell phones first came out and we first started learning how to text. And I hated it. I hate it when my kids sent me a text. And now, you know, this was 10 years ago. And I didn't know how to text. And I thought, why can't they just call me? Well, they aren't going to call me. They're going to text me. Because that's now how they communicate. And I realized I better learn... I better learn this. You know, that was just a little flip phone. So it was all these, yeah, right? <laughs> and I just thought, oh, for goodness sakes, just give me a call. <laughs> but pretty soon you realize this is how they're going to talk to you. So I better learn it, right? And that's what our prayer language is. It's how Holy Spirit speaks to us. And we need to learn it. We need to invest in it. And we need to learn not to just hear, but listen, really listen, and to be a doer of what Holy Spirit is saying. And as well, Pastor Felix talked on Sunday night about the glory in our story. We all have a story, and God is bringing forth glory in what he's calling us to do and how we follow through in that instruction. And this morning, the Holy Spirit's been speaking to me about righteousness. The last message that Apostle shared with us before he left on his sabbatical was on the fruit of the Spirit. And he said, at age 87, he said, I wish I would have been paying more attention and preaching more messages on doing because, see, there's that deposit when we become a born-again believer and the Spirit comes within us. There's a deposit to be able to draw on those virtues and to be able to do them if we'll yield to it, if we'll submit to it. Everything in the kingdom is a process of us submitting to it, giving ourselves to it. He quoted a scripture that really resonated with me. In the past months, I've realized that I've done many things that the Holy Spirit has shown me to do. But I, I haven't done everything. There's some things I didn't do. I thought, oh, I'll do it later, or oh, somebody else will do it. I just, I stepped back. I didn't do it. And when Apostle was preaching, he declared this statement. I heard it, awake to righteousness. Awake to righteousness. In 1 Corinthians 15, 34, awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And what Paul is correcting is that the Corinthians, because they would participate in baptism based on a Christian relative, or a Christian friend, or a minister who had led them to the Lord, but now they had passed away. They would base their baptism on that. And Paul's saying there's no resurrection power in that baptism. Your baptism needs to be based on the salvation of Jesus Christ in your life. Only Jesus is resurrected. His resurrection is what makes his righteousness so powerful in our lives. He says, don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. We just saw that this week. So many times our politicians, we vote them in, and they have good virtues, and pretty soon by the end of their first um, run term, they're not voting the way they said they were going to vote. Now they've been influenced by the politics. They've been influenced by probably the money involved in it because all of those are huge industries. And Paul says evil company corrupts good habits. Evil is what is morally wrong. In the Hebrew, evil means loving what is worthless, what is ill-favored, what is unfortunate. 
Evil is hurtful, as in Genesis 37, 33, when Jacob said, my son's long garment, an evil wild beast has devoured him. Joseph is without debt, without doubt, rent in pieces. In other words, the brothers brought back that coat and said he was killed. And Jacob is, is mourning. And Jacob, could Jacob love the animal that rent his son into pieces? Yet men love that which is hurtful. We just saw that. There are men that love late-term abortion. That's hurtful. Evil is sad and sorrowful, as in Proverbs 25, 19 to 20. Confidence in an unfaithful, evil man in times of trouble is like a broken tooth or a foot out of joint. He who sings songs to a heavy heart is like him who lays off a garment in cold weather and like vinegar upon soda. So dictators who turn off the heat in the coldest part of their winter, they're hurtful. It's evil. Evil is depravity and wickedness, as in Genesis 6-5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every imagination and intention of all human thinking was only evil, continually. And that scripture comes right before the flood. It takes a greater power to uproot evil in a heart of man, and that power is righteousness. That power is the righteousness of the word and the righteousness of the blood of Jesus. So we are listening to advice and we're watching habits and we're watching lifestyles of people who are not believers in Jesus. We become corrupted by their thoughts. We become corrupted by their ways and by their thinking and their reasonings. And Paul is saying, awake to righteousness because righteousness is the opposite of evil. You see, murder is the fruit of hate. And when we can vote in men and women that believe in in abortion, what we're really voting in is a spirit of hate. And that's what's risen up in our nation, a spirit of hate. As we read the word, we see that God is always looking for a righteous man or woman to work through. And in that last scripture that I just read to you in Genesis 6, in verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You see, God is always looking for a vessel of righteousness. I want you to say this, I am a vessel of righteousness. I am a vessel of righteousness. Paul said, awake to righteousness. You know, that's been a refreshing to my soul as I've been preparing for this message, because I've known for a couple of weeks, and the Holy Spirit has really been speaking to me. Righteousness. In the Hebrew, the word of righteousness means to be straight, to be justified, and pronounced innocent and happy, a spirit of joy. So righteousness is just, like in Habakkuk 2.4. Look at the proud. His soul is, is not straight or right within him. But the just and the uncompromisingly righteous man shall live by his faith and in faithfulness. We're going to come back to that. Righteousness is right and straight. Psalms 23.3. David says that the paths of righteousness, righteousness are always straight and right. The way leads to God. Righteousness is to have a just cause, to be in the right to be good. Righteousness is to speak truth, as in Job 33, 12, when Elihu contends with Job about everything he's been saying. And he says, look in this, you are not righteous. I will answer you, for God is greater than men. How many times have we sat and listened to a family member or a friend complain and just whine and just accuse even, even accuse have we, been, have we been, had enough grace in our spirit to know, we know the Holy Spirit is speaking to say, listen, what you're saying is not right. 
And this is what God says. That's what Elihu was to Job in that moment. He spoke truth. When Prophet Ed was here, he made a comment to me. And he said this. He, he, he said that why his prayers, this is why his prayers get answered. And he pointed at Apostle Lion. It's the righteousness he lives his life by. It's because of how he yields to God, how he yields to the Holy Spirit in overseeing faith center and his personal life, how he lives privately when no one's watching, doing the right thing, keeping his path straight, standing for the just cause in our time and speaking truth. I'm his daughter. I know that's true. James 5.16 we know this scripture, we, we repeat it all the time. I've been repeating a lot because I'll come down to that point where it says Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't. And I've been praying that it will not snow and ice on Sundays. And you know what? It hasn't. It's come really close, but we're still in the house of God. Amen? Amen. But James 5.16, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. There's two kinds of righteousness that we walk in. When we read that scripture in James 5 about the righteous man whose prayers avail much, we think that that person is someone that's perfect and he's in the know with God. There's just this, this constant communication going on. But if we go further into verse 17, Paul says that he's a man like us, that Elijah has a nature like mine. Elijah has a nature like yours. In other words, there are days you wake up and you don't feel very spiritual, right? And yet you know that you're saved, but feeling spiritual, and we think that a righteous man just feels that all the time. It's just always on him. With a nature like ours, he did, but what Elijah did was he did what God asked him to do what the Holy Spirit told him to do. Elijah was a doer. He was a doer in the word, and Elijah was a doer in the spirit. He heard God. He heard Holy Spirit. There's two kinds of righteousness. When we're saved, we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us, to come and live in us. We are made righteous at that very moment. Right then, we are cleansed. Just as we were created in the image of God, now when I pray for people for healing, I'll declare that their bodies, because they they're, were created in the image of God, we're the only ones created in God's image. And God has all of the same systems and organs in his body that we do. And they function according to their design. They never fail. And so when I pray for healing, I'll declare that from the top of our head to the soles of our feet, every system, every organ, every tissue in our body, every muscle, every bone, that it is healed and that it's functioning according to the image of God that we live in. But when we become saved and we ask the Lord to forgive us of our sins, now our spirit comes into the image of God. It comes into that complete, forgiven just image. Right then, we are, made, we are made completely clean. Our spirit has been conformed to the image of God. And that's what happens. That's when we become righteous. And that's what happens when we ask the Lord into our heart. The thief, the thieves on the cross on both of his sides. One of them mocked Christ. He said, if you're really God... Get us off these crosses. And the other thief looked at him and said, don't you have any fear of God? Because that thief had been watching how Jesus had been handling the whole thing. He knew exactly what Jesus was feeling because he was feeling it too. He knew it all. And he was watching that grace. He didn't know what it was that was on Jesus to accept the penalty of something that he never did. And the thief said to the other thief, he said, don't you have any fear of God? He said, we're paying for our deeds. But he did nothing. 
And he, and he said to Jesus, he said, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And the Lord Jesus, right then, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. In other words, that thief experienced righteousness at that moment. His sins were forgiven, not because of a sacrifice of an animal, but because of the freshly shed blood of the man that was right next to him. He was being cleansed, and he would know the kingdom of God that day, and he would know the righteousness and the justification. He, he was now justified of all of his sins. What that is is imputed righteousness. When that happens to us, it is imputed righteousness into our lives. Imputed righteousness, you could say, is inputted. When you get a new phone, you get a phone that is operating off from an inputted software. And we're counting on it, right? Boy, we're, when we finally get to get that new phone, we are counting on that new phone and that it is functioning according to how we've seen others work their phones. And we know that it's really going to help us in our daily lives. We're looking forward to it. Sometimes when we can't figure out why our phone is acting goofy, um, we or our computers are acting goofy, we turn them off and we reset them. We go back to getting it lined up with its original software, right? Which means we have to yield to it. That software isn't going to do what we tell it to do. That we still have to yield to the processes that that software tells us that we're going to do in order to get it to function and work the way we need it to work for us. And we do it. We do what that software requires. It's inputted. We have to do that in our walk with the Lord. When we get off, when something gets to us or we're frustrated or it's gotten really complicated, maybe there's a lot of acu uh, uh, confusion. Many times we just need to repent. We need to just stop. Sometimes we have to ask forgiveness for how we handled something. We might even have to make a phone call and just say, you know what, I just completely melted down over it and I'm sorry. I know you were doing the very best you could. And we have to get things reset. And that's what repentance does. I always told my kids, repentance is really underrated. Repentance just clears a lot of confusion, like turning off your phone and letting it reset. It just clears a lot of it out of the way because at that point, you get right back into righteousness with the Lord and in walking straight, going on that straight path. Because if you don't, if you don't reset it, now you've got to cover all the stupid things you did. Right? Yeah, it's true. That's what we have to do. We have to do that in our walk with the Lord. But we have to submit to that. Just like we have to submit to the software and our computers and our phones, we have to submit to what the Word says that we need to do to get back in order and to get back on track. There's another kind of righteousness, and it's imparted righteousness. And that's really where I'm heading this morning. Imparted righteousness. Abraham, we hear a lot about Abraham, but you know there's really a lot about him we don't know. After he had followed God and took Sarah and Lot and all that he had to Canaan, because Abraham listened to God and would do what he asked, God blessed him. And we know that he finally blessed him with the son Isaac, and God made a covenant with Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. Now, we've heard that, and we know that. It's really the foundation, part of the foundation of our faith. By the time Isaac came along, it had been over 30 years of doing everything that God had asked him. And yet now God has asked for Isaac. And Abraham was willing to sacrifice him and hold nothing back from God. Hebrews 11, 17 to 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. 
of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding that God, Abraham concluded, his, his um, response, his default, Abraham's default was to conclude that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Now, Abraham had seen Isaac grown. When it says a figurative sense, Abraham had seen it. I believe Abraham had seen him in what God showed him, but he probably saw Isaac in dreams. Can you imagine? Maybe he saw Isaac being a father. Maybe he saw Isaac in a part of Isaac's life. But figuratively, Abraham believed God because of what God had shown him. He kept his eye on the promise, not only through the birth of Isaac, which took 25 years, but the possible death. He kept his eyes on God. Six different times the Bible records, and he, Abraham, believed the Lord, and he trusted him, and he, God, accounted it to Abraham as righteousness. From Genesis to Revelations, what we know about Abraham, he trusted God, and God credited it to him as righteousness. The righteousness we see Abraham grow in, it's an imparted righteousness. He did what God asked him to do. He humbled himself to God, he listened and he believed him, and he trusted that God would do everything that he promised. His righteousness came from just listening, hearing God and listening and doing it. You know, we hear a lot about Abraham, but there's so much we don't know. He was before the law. So everything he did was through an imparted righteousness. Hearing God, lining up with God, right down to circumcision. Boy, wouldn't you wonder if he really heard God? I mean, you better have heard God. This is pretty dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> the righteousness that we see Abraham grow in was that imparted righteousness. And he fully trusted God that he would do everything he said. I've wondered how Abraham ever began hearing God in the first place. As I was studying that, I thought, and I knew Abraham represented imparted righteousness. I thought, why did he even start listening to God? And we don't really know. We don't know a lot about Abraham. But in Genesis eleven twenty seven, the word says, Abraham's father, Terah, had three sons. Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran had a son, Lot, and Haran passed away. So Terah took Lot, his grandson, Abram, and Sarah, and they were going to Canaan. And it says in verse 30 that Sarah was barren. Now by this time, they were in their 70s. And so Abraham had watched how the other brothers had children, raised them, but had always seen the heartache in his wife when their children never came. Because in that day, that was huge, having lots of children. I believe that Abram began hearing God because he had a desire in his heart for a family. I believe he had a desire to see Sarah's pain, that hurtfulness, not be there anymore. I believe he was, in his heart, in his soul, he was crying out, why can't she, why can't my wife, why can't we have a family? There was a disappointment because of the barrenness that was in their home, Abraham and Sarah's house. So in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I bet his ears perked up. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham heard families. That's what he heard. The word families and the sense that it was given to him at that moment it meant a family of people, or a type, or a kind of people. It could be as narrow as an immediate family, or it could be as big as a nation. 
But God said nation. He said families, and he said nation. So Abraham's understanding, it's a, it will be a kind of me. He started listening to God because God was calling on something that he wanted. He was putting his hand on it. When we read this passage in Genesis 12, it indicates that God separated Abraham from his idolatrous family. In order to make him and his descendants that messianic nation, which would bring salvation to all the earth. Now imagine what God was doing in Abraham would bring, would eventually bring salvation. We understand our salvation because of of Abraham following what the Lord did and Christ coming down through that line. Abraham worked, walked out righteousness. The only thing he knew was to listen to God because there was no law at that point. He followed God by hearing him and obeying him. And from Genesis to Revelations, when it's spoken about Abraham, the word says that he believed God and it was credited to him, it was accounted to him, It just kept stacking up for him righteousness. Everything. You know, I remember the first time I realized that statement, accounted for righteousness. I remember I was just believing the Lord at that time my brother was sick. And I remember thinking, Lord, if you would just heal him, I won't ask for anything else. And later on in my life, I realized I can ask for everything. I can believe for everything because that's what Abraham did. He believed for everything. He didn't trade. He didn't barter. He didn't negotiate. He believed God for everything that God want, that he wanted. There were two men in the Bible that were asked to give all. Two men. You know, <clears throat> your children are your everything. They're the only thing you're going to take to heaven with you. Everything else will stay here. As Prophet Ed Trout says, the Muslims are going to get it all. But our children, what we do for the kingdom, that's what we take with us to heaven. And God asked Abraham for Isaac. That was his everything. And yet Abraham kept his eyes on how God had constantly met everything and done everything he had promised. So he knew, he concluded. The word says he concluded. Somehow he'll work this out. The rich young ruler, Mark 10, 17. Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and he said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Jesus loved him. Jesus wanted the best for him. Jesus desired more than that for this young man. He loved him and he said this, Now, up to this point, that young man had done everything that the law had required, and he was righteous. Most likely, he had gone to the temple, he had made sacrifice with the priest, and he was righteous. He had done everything that the law required, that the system. He had done what was required by the Ten Commandments and by the written word of God. But now he has a desire for more of God. He wants more. So Jesus looks at him and he says, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven and come and take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. The young man had received righteousness by fulfilling the Ten Commandments and he no doubt by going to the temple, making the sacrifice. He trusted Jesus for salvation but he couldn't trust him for his needs and for his destiny. Jesus was right in front of him, speaking to him and loving him. Right in front of him. Can you imagine looking in those eyes of love? Wanting the very best for him, wanting more. 
Later in that same chapter where he's speaking to the young man, he has this discussion with the disciples. Then Peter, because they're, they're standing there, they're watching the whole thing, and Peter says to the Lord, well, we've left all. We've given out all, and we've followed you. And you guys, you know, you've heard me repeat this verse many times because I love this scripture. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or father or mother or wife or children. Children? What did he ask Abraham for? His son. Children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mother and children's and lands and nations with persecution and in the age to come, eternal life. I love that scripture because no matter what I do for God's kingdom, if I'll just obey him and do it regardless of the resistance, regardless of the perceived persecution that's around it, You know, Apostle has received persecution for making the political stance that he makes. But it doesn't matter to him. He's not going to be quiet. He's not going to be silent. The Bible says that when you do that, that there's a hundredfold return. There's a hundredfold return in my healing. When I continue to lay hands on people and pray for them, I might not see it right there at that moment, but there's a hundredfold return. They might even reject you at that time when you say, I want to pray for you. There's a hundredfold return in provision, not just a monetary provision, but a provision where all of a sudden there's something you don't need anymore. Because what you thought you needed, you don't. It works out that, you know what, it's covered and it's taken care of. There's a provision where all of a sudden I've experienced with my kids where I asked for a scholarship and there wasn't one available and pretty soon I get the call, oh, you know what, somebody just turned theirs down. There's provision, there's a hundredfold return. There's 100-fold return in every area of our life, in everywhere that we decide we're going to trust God and we're going to move forward in what he's spoken to us, God says... I have a hundredfold return for you. Imputed righteousness makes us right with God. And if we never grow in his promise, if we never, in keeping that law, really allow Holy Spirit to show us those deeper issues in our life, like why we can't keep the fruit of the spirits, why we can't be more patient, why we can't be more kind, why why can't I have self-control? If we never go past just doing what's required and just being saved, if we never just really press in and let Holy Spirit speak and listen, we'll end up walking away from life-changing experiences that were meant for us to apprehend our promise and our destiny and to facilitate marvels, wonders, and miracles. One of the things I'm always aware of when I see a challenge in front of me is I know that there are two men standing behind me. That when their day comes to make that stand, it's going to be harder because the spirit of evil is going to be greater on the earth. And they sure better see their dad and I going after righteousness, going after God. When the Bible told Joseph or uh, Joshua to be strong and courageous, you don't need courage if you're not afraid right? It wasn't there. Moses, he said, Moses, instruct him, be strong and courageous. He told Joshua time and time, be strong and courageous. You know why? It wasn't there. It's sort of like submit. It's not agreement, right? So sometimes when we read these things, let's just think about what the opposite is, which means that's what was really present. And God is speaking to it. Holy Spirit is instructing it. Imputed righteousness makes us right. Righteousness is conformity to God's image. It's conformity to that spirit image of God. If we'll receive imparted righteousness, hearing him and doing it, that conformity of all he is, it expands into all that we can become. 
I'm going to say that again. Righteousness is conformity to God's image. If we'll receive imparted righteousness, that conformity of all that he is expands and it grows into all that we can become. Imparted righteousness. Matthew 3, 13 to 15. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? John felt inferior. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. What is all righteousness? It's what God his Father required It's why he sent him on the earth in sending Jesus to the earth, and it was Jesus' desire to accomplish it. All righteousness. So besides what was required, it was a heart that desired it. Jesus says so that all righteousness, because he wants our heart, yes? It's a combination of not just doing what's required, but accomplishing it with a heart that is always yielding, always trusting, and always desiring more. We could say imputed righteousness is what is required, but imparted righteousness is what is desired. Desired with God. John 5, 18 to 20, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, Because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. But when you're righteous, you are. Amen? Because now that spirit is conformed to Father God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. I'm going to change that a little. For the Father loves you. And he shows you all things that he himself does. And he will show you greater works than these that you may marvel. The glory to your story, as Pastor Felix preached last Sunday night. See, we need to do what God requires for our salvation and our justification, but it's more than that. It's desiring to fill everything that God sees us doing. See, he, see, he saw what he wanted for Abraham. What he wanted for Abraham isn't the same thing that he wants for me, but what he wants for me has glory to God in it. In that DNA, I will show you greater works. The reason I'm sharing this message this morning, Faith Center, is because Holy Spirit says that I want my people to grow in the imparted righteousness that I am speaking to them, all of what I desire for them, expanding into a greater image of God. In that moment when Jesus spoke to the young rich ruler, to the young man. Jesus was creating a way for that young man's capacity in God to become greater. There was going to grow in that young man a greater capacity to do great things for the Lord, and that's really what that young man wanted. Responding to imparted righteousness will produce marvels, wonders, and miracles. For too long, we have been asleep We hear the Holy Spirit, and we're just kind of dozy. (laughs) It's sort of like when, um, you know, you're sleeping, you're in a really good sleep, but you you know you need to get up (laughs) and adjust the thermostat. And you're hoping your spouse will do it. And he's hoping you'll do it. Sometimes we're just asleep. And we just want to stay in our comfortable position until we think it's time to wake up. But God is speaking. Isaiah 5.20, woe to those who, who call evil good and good evil, 
who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. In the last days, when the world calls good evil and evil good, what we saw on that slide, imputed righteousness should respond with the fruits of the Spirit. And I know even as I saw that, I began just praying. It's a spirit of hate. And the Holy Spirit showed me this past week that when I forbid the spirit of hate, then I've got to allow a new spirit. And it's a spirit of love. It's a spirit of righteousness. And I'll declare and I'll say, Lord, for those that have been praying and those that there are people around that governor that are believers and that love them, I am part that love. I am part for there to be a a deposit upon him so that he starts looking and he starts turning his head to righteousness. There's a place where we release that spirit. You know, when we read about Abraham, initially God told Terah, Abraham's dad, to get out of his country and to go to Canaan. But they got as far as Haran, and Abraham's dad passed away because they had stayed there. When Terah went there, they didn't go to Canaan. They got to Haran, and he just stayed there. But pretty soon, he passed away. And after he died was when God spoke to Abraham to get up and to go where I will bless you. Abraham could have stayed, and that would have been it. He could have just stayed there. God would have looked for another righteous man that would hear him. But that desire for more was strong and to move in it. And he had to let go of the persuasion of his father. He had to let go of the persuasion of the gods, the idols that they worshipped. When we read God's word about forgiveness of our sin, and this is something that the Lord has told me I'm going to be talking more about this year. We, have to, we can't overlook the iniquity. David said in Psalms, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin. My mother conceived me. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. God addresses iniquity over 200 times in his word. And what it comes down to is that default behavior that we watched while we were growing up that was compromising. Maybe even we grow up, I mean, every home has them. Every single home has them. And it's an attitude. It's, a, it's something that we do. It's a bend in the family that, that makes it not quite straight. And we become dull to that iniquity because it's just the way it's always been. But see, for Abraham to apprehend the promise, he had to let go of what his dad held on to. And he had to not only let it go for the promise to come forth in his life, he had to let it go for Isaac. He had to let it go for Jacob. He had to let it go for the nation that was coming up. That iniquity had to be walked away from. It had to be, he had to walk away from it and never look back, never pick up those gods again, never pick up those ways again. Second Timothy says, nevertheless, solid, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We know we're forgiven of our sins, but so many times what we don't realize is that we also need to get free of the iniquity. It's part of that righteousness that God has in our life, the behavior that we grew up around. It's not because we initiated that behavior. We didn't. We just learned it. It just happened. And eventually, we end up doing it, even if we end up not liking it or despising it. If we don't allow our hearts and our soul to be transformed by God's word, And by his spirit, it will end up becoming our default behavior. Habakkuk said in chapter 2, verse 4, the uncompromisingly righteous live by faith, the imparted, where we trust him, and in faithfulness, the imputed, where we repent and we ask his forgiveness and we believe him to break the chains, to break every bondage, every curse of the enemy. I know for me this year, even in 
preparing for this message, there's been times where I've just stopped. And I've said, yes, Lord, I'll do what you've asked me to do. I'll do it. And God wants to do wonders. He wants to do marvels. He wants to do miracles. If God's going to do that in this church, that means he's going to do it through you. Because you're faith center. You are faith center. And there's an imparted, there's a great imparted righteousness. The move of the Holy Spirit that's present here. And we're going to apprehend it. I want you to stand before we have prayer. And we're going to activate. I want you to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I ask Holy Spirit to help me. That I will listen to your direction. And that I will trust that direction. When I'm facing pressure, frustrations, situations that are confusing, you have promised to strengthen me, to direct me, and to give to me wisdom, to enlarge me in whatever I set my hand to do. I rely on your grace to deliver me and to increase my capacity. I respond, Lord, to your imparted righteousness so that I can do all that you planned to do through me. Amen.